Hello, everybody. I am Andrew Meredith, and I'm here today. We're going to make some lumpus bread, and that is uh, in preparation for tomorrow night, of which you just saw the preview for. We're going to be watching Lord of the Rings, the extended edition, over six nights. So that uh, is going to be half a movie tomorrow night, half of the second half of the Fellowship on Saturday night, so on and so forth, all the way through Wednesday, and that is to commemorate the celebration of. May the 4th, no, sorry, ah, March 4th unto Mordor, uh, which is Saturday, right? So we're going to be making Lembus bread in preparation for that. First, I thought I would introduce myself. Again, I'm Andrew D. Meredith. I am the author of the books Thrice, which is the SBFBO semifinalist um, for this year, one of the semifinalists for this year. Uh, that's a Slavic fantasy uh, adventure. I also have uh, Deathless Beast, which is book one of the Collation Saga, and book two of the Collation Saga, Bone Shroud. All three of these books are already available. And then in one month from this Saturday on the 4th, we're going to be releasing the sequel to Thrice, which is called Forscored. And then this summer, we'll see some more from Collation as well. So, hi, Kay. Welcome. Glad you could make it. Um, I have prepped some things, and we're going to get going on the lembus bread here real fast. Um, it is basically a focaccia recipe. Uh, I've put the recipe ingredients up in the comments, and you can check that out there. Um, I've only done one step ahead of time, and that is getting my yeast alive. So what I did is I took my yeast, which is a packet of yeast, or in my case, I put about 12 grams of yeast uh, into two tablespoons of sugar and a cup of warm water, like 90 degrees. You don't want it too hot, which is bad for the yeast. You don't want it cold or it won't wake it up. Um, the cool thing about yeast is, is even if it's dead, it's not dead unless it's been frozen. So if it's in the fridge, you can have yeast that's just not working. Just give it more time to wake up. And so I put a little extra sugar in there to make sure it was waking up. And I've got it nice and puffy in my mixer here. So it's got a nice big head of yeast. It's been running for about only about 15 minutes or so. But just having the warm water, just having the sugar um, is going to make the yeast start replicating because we're trying to get it going because yeast creates gas and for those gases you get air pockets, right? So, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to be taking our dry ingredients and putting those together right now. So I've got a bowl here. Um, <coughs> And over my big belly here, you can see I've got my Lembus bread shirt for us making Lembus bread today. So what I've got is uh, a cup and three quarters of flour. Um, if you're at a higher altitude, you can add a little extra flour. I think it's an extra two tablespoons will be enough to help it be a, be a, good, be a good flour. I'm going to put that here into my bowl. I'm also going to put two teaspoons of salt. Um, I always add a little extra salt because we like our bread a little saltier. Um, you don't want to add a lot of extra salt, but a little extra is not going to hurt. So like if you're if you're measuring by grams and you say you need 20 grams, going to 25 grams is not going to hurt it. Going to 30 can stunt the yeast. So you want to be careful with that. So I've added my, my sugar, right? And I've got over a teaspoon of um, Italian seasoning. So I'm going to pop that in there and I'm going to mix it up. So thing with bread, it's super easy as long as you're following the instructions. There are, there, you don't tweak a whole lot. There are certain things you can tweak, but know those ahead of time. Um, for this, there's not going to be, a, it's, this is not a very, um, this is not a very labor intensive uh, recipe at all because it's a focaccia. We're not trying to get a whole bunch of gluten uh, strands developed. It's going to be very low maintenance, low touch. Uh, I've got these all mixed together. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, put these into my mixer and start kneading it together. Um, we do want it to be sticky. We want it to be wet. We want it to be almost unhandleable um, because that just too dry and there's nowhere for the yeast to go. You want some a good, a good amount of wet. Um, so I'm gonna turn on my mixer. It's gonna get a little loud and start just allowing the, the dry, mix, dry mix to go into there. Honestly, the only way to get good at bread is to do 
lots of bread. Make bread as often as you can and um, and follow your instructions. The other day I made a, a bread and my daughter was tasting it and said, there's something weird about this, dad. And I tasted it and I was like, no, it, it worked. Everything was raised. It looked like bread. And I had not put any salt in it. So it was really incredibly dry. We ended up cutting it up, freezing it, and we'll use it in um, stuffing. So it didn't go bad. It just wasn't made correctly. So I adjusted and I'm going to use it in stuffing because we can soak it with, um, with chicken bouillon and uh, make something for that. So um, right now it's still a little dry on the outside. I'm just letting it mix with the stand mixer with my bread, with my bread arm. Um, I'm going to go down in and uh, stop it and pull the dry down into the wet to make sure it is getting a good mix. So the thing with yeast that I wanted to talk about is that um, no matter what your recipe says, you've got a recipe that says it's an hour, you can have pizza dough in an hour. If it takes yeast, um, make sure you give yourself extra time or you've got your yeast alive ahead of time. It could be hours ahead of time. You don't want to go more than 24 hours ahead of time, but if you're making pizza dough for, for dinner, um, you can after lunch throw your yeast into some warm water, the warm water and sugar you'll be using four hours later to get that yeast awake. It may bubble up and stop bubbling up, but now the yeast has activated, it's alive and ready to go so that when it is added to the flour, it will start doing um, doing stuff. Um, Kay, my favorite, my favorite, uh, Kay's asking what my favorite uh, bread recipe is to make. I make uh, a lot of sourdough, but it isn't often sour. So sometimes uh, I, I don't try to keep my sourdough alive for, for months um, because I don't make bread every single week. I'll often make like 13 loaves over the course of 24 hours and then freeze them. Um, but then it's months before I make it again. And so by that time, my, I forgot to feed the sourdough and it's gone kind of, it's gone too funky. Funky is okay, but if it smells wrong, throw it out. And so I make a lot of, I tend to make a lot of fresh, non-sour sourdough where I'll take some yeast, get it alive, add some beer into it. Um, especially if it's like a, from a microbrewery or, or homemade beer, so then you've got active yeast that's going, and it adds its own flavors to it. If you keep that that sourdough alive, it will start to sour, and the way you keep it from being funky is by feeding it. It will start to give off those really funky flavors and tastes um, from sitting around starving. So if you open it up and it smells, it smells putrid, throw it away. If it smells a little cheesy, that's okay. If you if if you're not if you're if you're iffy about it. You can feed it one extra day, add a little more extra flour to it. And if that makes the funky smell go away, it means all the yeast was doing was asking for some food. Um, so I like making sourdough because I can get a lot of sourdough going and I just keep adding more flour and water. And I'll have several jars of sourdough. sourdough and then I'll use it all up right away and make um, and make 13 loaves. Or I'll make you know a batch, which will make me like eight loaves, six or eight loaves. And then as that one's being baked, I start the next one and make the next one the following morning. So on. So I do that. Um, so I like making that because it's my own bread. It's good and mixed now. I'm gonna scrape it off of my hook and just leave it down in there. And I'm just gonna leave it to sit. Um, it's gonna be about half an hour. Um, so if you're if you're still cooking and you're st and you're not caught up, that's good. Keep going. Um, so while we're letting it sit and letting it rise and double, I'll talk about another couple other things, and then we can chat and have fun. Um, what we're what I'm doing is I'm gonna let it rise, right? And I have not preheated my oven. Um, so reason for that is that you can actually cheat and use the warming of the oven as a means to force some rise and get a lot of really big bubbles in it. Um, and since this is basically a focaccia recipe, um, I'm going to do that. So I've got a stone out. Oh, no, I don't have a stone because I, I, like, I don't like cooking on cold stones at all. If you've got a stone, 
you got to have it preheated with or, or cast iron too. If you're cooking on a cast iron or stone, get your preheat going, get your stone in. And even if when it tells you it's all heated up, I let it go in there for at least another 20 minutes before you put anything into it. In this case, I'm just using, going to be using a big flat pan. Um, and when we get to it, we're not going to, we're not going to need this bread at all. It has now been stirred. It's good. Um, it's going to be spread and just allowed to spread across the, the whole of this, of this pan without any additional kneading because we don't want gluten strains uh, that are going to form from, from your, um, from your, um, from your working it. So, um, we are going to just put a little olive oil in this pan over here. Um, just a couple of tablespoons. Honestly, bread is not that daunting. The daunting part about bread is that it can be messed up. But I often take the same stance that I do when I when I took up um, home brewing, is that I will always drink my mistakes. And I will always eat my mistakes unless it is so bad it's unedible, inedible. But like I said, we have that bread I made with no salt, and we just froze it and we used it in stuffing. You know, but it stuck it back in the oven, let it dry out, so it's that so it's a dry bread and I got croutons, not salty, but that's what chicken bouillon is for. Um, but honestly, just get out there and make bread, make some mistakes. And if there's a mistake that you think you made because it didn't rise, then go look it up and see what you can do, what you can do better next time. So let's see what everybody's talking about because now Andrew's here. So chaos has arrived. <laughs> I am also, I'm also a card monster. I love bread so much. Oh, this is what they want. Hello. It's backwards. You absolutely can use whole wheat for a starter. Um, if that's what you cook in, that's what you cook in. Um, whole wheat or rye uh, is denser, right? So it's going to they probably need more water. Um, but the uh, you can use whole wheat just give yourself more time and allow things to be wetter. Um, yeah, whole, whole wheat, whole wheat's just fine. If, especially if you have a food allergy and you need to be using like a, like an old grain, um, doing a hundred percent rye is usually a bad idea. That's why most rye recipes are partial rye, but whole wheat, you can totally go, um, you can do, you could do all whole wheat. It's just going to be a denser loaf, uh, which may mean you're going to need to give it more time on the yeast. So if you're rising a bread, um, Give it time. Let it do its thing. 24 hours is the cutoff. Um, like a like a, a bread that's been rising for, I think it goes to like 23 hours. And at 24 hours, it goes bad um, because it starts going rancid. Um, so don't let your rise go that long. But, but it's always great to get a dough started the night before and do all of your kneading. Like I, I, I do a no knead method. So that's where I mix it all together. Then I pour it into a bowl and then I just take you grab the back end and you fold it over on itself every half hour for two hours. No, just a little stretch, boom, done. Little stretch, boom, done. And then I leave it. And then after two hours of doing that, you can leave your dough, cover it over and let it go all night long. Um, and then, um, then you're ready the next day to do some, to do their final rise. If you're going to lie it out and put it onto, um, onto, onto your table and get things into loaf shape while you're heating up your oven and getting things ready for that. Um, so for those of you arriving late, we, like I said, we're going to be doing Lord of the Rings watch along starting tomorrow night. Um, it's going to be eight o'clock mountain time. Um, so for you East coasters, it'll be at nine o'clock, 10, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock. Yeah, Seven, you know, eight mountain time is where we're going to be. Um, and we're going to watch the first half of Fellowship tomorrow night. And then we're going to watch the second half of Fellowship on 
Saturday night, so on and so forth, all the way through Wednesday. Obviously, you can watch it on replay. We're not going to have the um, the video playing in a window because that will get us hit with copyright. So those of us who are on the stream are going to be listening to it on our Bluetooth or watching captions, even if it means you don't get to hear the awesome music, and just doing commentary like when you're watching Lord of the Rings commentary with, um, with you know, Dom and, and um, Mary and Pippin, right? which is the best commentary, but we're going to make ours even better, right? Uh, so we'll be starting at 8 o'clock, and then um, uh, we'll probably start within 15 minutes after we introduce ourselves and talk about who we are. Um, I'll have my Lembus bread to eat and keep me full. Um, probably have six or seven, you know. Um, I have an old I have I have an old beer that I made that's meant to be the Sh a Shire beer, so I'll probably have a glass of that. And, and we'll just do our thing. So, yeah. You probably notice I have some decorations around here. I have my, you know, you can even see it. This is my copy of Return of the King, um, which is signed by the king himself and has his picture on it. And uh, so that's one of my, my pretty prized possessions. Um, because, yes, I have met Viggo Mortensen when he came into our bookstore the day after Christmas. And um, it was the coolest weirdest thing that's ever happened to me in my life um i nobody was coming in it was snowy outside and um i wasn't even paying attention i had my face down reading a book and this individual walked in the door i was about to look up when he walked up to me and very softly said can you please tell me where your bird books are and i looked up and i'm looking at my king and he's standing in front of me and I almost froze up and I very calmly tried not to panic. And I said, uh, yeah, just uh, up the stairs and off to the right because I couldn't leave my uh, station. And he said, thank you. He walked upstairs and then I freaked out. And I was trying to find something to get signed. My manager was getting excited. Didn't even know who he was. Um, ugh, heathen. And uh, found this copy of Return of the King with his face on it. And I'm sure he knew what I was going to do because I had it sitting there on the desk when he came back and he bought a giant stack of bird books. He very nicely and tenderly put them down and then um, dumped a bunch of Russian books on because he was studying for Eastern Promises. And then as he finished buying them, because he's buying the bird books for his father for Christmas, because that's how he was in town, um, I said, can I, can I get this signed? So I have a copy of Return of the King signed by Viggo Mortensen. So, yeah, pretty cool, because uh, he lives not far from uh, my hometown um, where I was working. So that's, it was pretty cool. I've seen him one other time when we went up to the city he lives in for a, he was doing a showing of Captain Fantastic, which was also great to go see. I didn't get to see him, like, meet him, but we got to see him, you know, from 20 aisles back. That was pretty cool. Um, let's see, I've got a copy of Return of the King, uh, of all four of them that I saved from destruction at the same bookstore. Um, I My dad had, the co had a copy just like this too, uh, which is in the gold box. And I saw that we had gotten into the used books, um, these four books, and all four of them were there, but I know that it comes with this box. And I said, where's this box? And discovered it was sitting in the back waiting to be gone, to be taken out to the recycling to just be destroyed. And I very quickly uh, purchased uh, my copy of <laughs> of all four of them um, in in the gold box. So um, and I got similarly into match with to go with that too. All right, so uh, we've had this sitting. We're at 19 minutes. Uh, we're gonna give it about 10 more minutes uh, to sit in there and double. Um, it is starting to grow, um, which is good. We want it to double. Um, theoretically, I should let it sit for about an hour, but because we're gonna cheat by uh, warming up the oven with it in there um we get to skip a lot of that well that's pretty cool um double check i've done everything here because we always want to make sure that we're following every single step that it says we have to do um let's see so Like I said, this is going to be super easy. Um, if you've ever made focaccia before, we are literally going to just spread it out on this. Theoretically, I should let it rise for a whole nother hour. Um, 
but I'm not going to get keep you guys here for for three hours while we do this. So it, that's why we're going to cheat and put it in the oven cold and turn the heat on, and that's going to cause it to expand some more. Um, the only thing we're going to lose from that is a little bit of the flavor, because just the development of yeast is going to add more flavor, and that's why you like a one hour pizza dough is great. But if you can give it three hours and take your time, you're going to get more uh, flavor out of your out of your dough when you do that. Um, and yes, Tori, I am following a outline because baking is a science and cooking is an art. And there are bits of art you can put into your baking, but always follow the recipe and always follow the outline uh, until you've done it so many times that you know your frontwards from your backwards. Um, but yeah, always, always follow, always follow your your instructions until you until you know what you can change it. Like in this case, uh, at the beginning, I was talking about how you can always add a little extra salt. You don't want to add a lot of extra salt because that will stunt the yeast from growing. But um, but you can always add a little bit of salt. When I'm making uh, a full dough loaf, um, that'll be about a thousand milligrams or a thousand grams of flour, and it's twenty grams of salt in that. And I go to 25, 23 or twenty five, and even then, it's probably not enough. Sometimes I'll salt the top of the bread too, um, because there's nothing like biting into a piece of bread and having crystal salt in there. It's so good. I love bread so much. Um, so uh, to kind of talk back through what we've done so far, we, before the stream started, we got our yeast going, right? We uh, added some sugar, which you could, I could have done honey as well, but you want a sugar to help the yeast really get going in some warm water, like 90 degree uh, water. You don't want it to be scalding hot or boiling water that will kill the yeast. Um, and you don't want it to be too cold or the yeast just doesn't bother waking up, right? So you want to get that yeast going. Um, yeah, time time was going to tell, okay? Uh, if you just started it, uh, you want about 15 minutes, give it a good stir, get some sugar in there. Um, if you don't feel, if, if the if, you, you'll know. Even if it's got a little bit of, a, of no head, but just shows some bubbles on top, it can be enough. If it's got a lot of bubbles, it's awake. Um, you can, um, like I said, you can always use, you can always use the bottom of a beer. Like if you happen to have, if you happen to go to um, uh, a brewery that does growlers and they'll pour it off, um, pour it in the growler and you get into the very bottom, that bottom bit that probably has a little bit of um, uh, detritus in it is fantastic for starters um, because it's going to have some active yeast in there and you can, and you can just go to town with it because they don't put any stunters in it like they do when they're doing bottling or like Coors Light is not a great, um, not a great beer for that. Um, and, you know, keeping a growler of, of dark beer around for making, um, batters and stuff for frying is, is always, is always really good. Um, but when you're, if you ever are, want to play with yeast, um, a really cool place to go, like go to your local bottle shop or, um, a place that'll sell like imported beers from Europe and try to get like a, um, a, mon a monastic beer or anything that's from Europe that often is, we'll say like bottle carbonated on it. That means it's coming from the brewery and it's got their yeast in there. And I have, I have propagated yeast from beer uh, that I've bought internationally and then built that up and then made beer with those, with those. Um, yeah, a lot of cool things you can do. And, and, you know, the cool thing about yeast is, is that yeast, is a very different characteristic depending on where it's from. We all use common Fleischmann bread yeast because it's very, very reliable. But you pull in, yeah, you pull in a Trappist beer or something like that, you can get some very different, very different beer uh, flavors, very different flavors in just your pizza dough or your bread uh, or anything you use yeast in. You don't have to use Fleischmann's. Fleischmann's is just reliable, but it has no flavor to it. It doesn't do anything special. It just makes bread which is fantastic, except that it's really fun to make like, you know, like, like a pizza dough, right? Pizza dough is great because it's, it's dough, but it doesn't need to rise a lot. It just needs some rise. So start playing with other yeasts that you, that you can get um, and see what it does. Um, because the worst that can happen is it doesn't, um, doesn't rise big, but you can always do more than that. Um, so, uh, Kay says, uh, have extra water just to consistency, like you mentioned. Um, yeah, th this this one's a very wet dough. Uh, if you ever make a lot of bread at home, uh, they'll talk about like a 75 to 80% wetness. And what that means is it's literally water weight to bread weight. So in a thousand grams of, um, uh, have a thousand grams of flour, 
uh, 800 grams would be an 80%. And that's a very wet sourdough. This is probably even wetter. Um, yeah, this is really wet. Um, but it's very spongy uh, because once I got it mixed and it was wet, I let it go. Um, so it's just sitting there. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think we do need to do a bread bake along here sometime soon. Um, I'm due to make some bread. I got to see how much flour I have. Um, but yeah, we can totally do a bake along. And um, the question will be whether I do it. I might, I might do parts, parts of it live. It may be what I'll do then is I'll start my, I'll have a bake along, but it'll be in the middle while I'm in transition between the two different batches. Cause like I said, I do about 12 loaves at a time. I'll do six loaves and then six loaves starting one evening and then doing it all over the course of the following day. So, um, yeah, yeah. All right. So I like how this is looking. I'm going to, we're, we're going to put it in the pan, right? All right. We'll see if we can do it right here. Okay. So I'm just going to pour it out. My pan. You can see here it's nice and spongy. It's got a little bit of flour on the bottom. I'm not really too worried about that, but I'm just dropping it all over my pan. I said we're not kneading this one we're trying to create bubbles not um not stretch because this is going to be much more of almost like a scone consistency um than than a bread or as um okay you can probably attest those canadian friends i have had in the past call it scones um I say scoon, but I also say big for that sack that, you know, sacks of money, I call them bigs. That is a mess. So what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to convince it to go into some square shapes. Don't know how much stretch I can get out of this. I can't really, can't really need it, right? Because we're trying not to need it. Push up here into the corners. It still has yeast all the way through it. So what I can also do, I'm probably just going to let it sit here for a little bit and do what it needs to do. Yeah, the Canadians I knew who called it scones were from uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and a couple on a couple from Ontario, but mostly from the the middle of Canada. So in hindsight, too late now, I would probably I probably should have made this as double batch, uh, and that would have filled this filled this pan. But like I said, I'm gonna let this sit for a little bit and do some rising and spreading. And um, because we want to get it in a square, so we cut it into our lumber spread, right? How is everybody else's? Um, how is everybody else's uh, bread coming? So, okay, for your starter, um, if this is a starter for sourdough, yeah, wait 24 hours. I started my yeast 15 minutes before um, before we put the before we uh, got on live, um, just enough to wake it up. That's all you're going. That's all you're doing, as opposed to like a full starter. Um, 
so th this is this is very much a I'm gonna make it now and we'll I'll be eating focaccia in in an hour probably um, so um, yeah so you know there's a difference between waking up your yeast and like for making like a pizza dough and doing a bread rise where you want to get a lot of really good really good yeast action um, so you can totally move on to the next stage and start baking if you're ba if you're prepping a starter for for dough yeah waiting waiting those 12 hours you know making it tomorrow morning uh, is a fantastic way to go um, you know that that's the only thing that is my least favorite part about baking is the patience part because I'm not patient um, and and you missed Chicago I'm wearing my Lumbus bread shirt but um, the the chat said I had to put on an apron so I had something to wipe my hands off on so Yeah, I have to get that. Uh, the um, my there, there's there's actually a uh, cooker out there in the in the shed, up, up so I can make beer. Yeah, yeah. All right. So like I said, you know, it's not not really pretty, but it is square. But I'm gonna let it sit here, and it the recipe also talks about um, I can shake my pan, get it nice and, and flat flatten-ish. Um, I'm also letting it rise and give me some room. Ugh. Here you go, Chaco. I'm wearing my Lumbus bread. Oh, sorry. There you go. Lumbus bread shirt. I need a new one. I need to talk to the uh, the artist who designed them uh, about doing a trade for a, a hoodie uh, for his. Um, he's got a hoodie for his uh, his Shire a Shire ale, and I need he, I've been talking for a while about doing a trade, and I just need to do it because I want a new version of my shirt because I wore through it. I bought those shirts right before COVID, my set of Lord of the Rings brew shirts. And um, that's all I wore from home for a year and a half, six days. I just rotated through them every six days. And um, so now they're all holy. Um, they were holy to start with because it's Lord of the Rings and that makes them holy. But uh, then they had holes in them. So... So right now I'm just kind of goading it to the edges. If I can get it to spread across the entire board, we'll have a nice flat lumbus spread. And then I'm gonna score. I'm gonna cut squares, uh, probably six full squares, and then I'm gonna score each of those into triangles so that they'll break. Um, what I did not pick up was banana leaves. Uh, oh, shame on me um, to wrap them in. But you can make lumbus spread wraps if you're taking it to a party. Um, with with banana leaves or you could make um i've seen some people just do like like green paper um and do that for your wraps um those are not good preservative methods but um the elves didn't have plastic so what are you gonna do right I tend to get the urge to bake on Sundays. Um, it's, it's funny, even if I have been creative all weekend long, I will all of a sudden go into a baking frenzy on Sunday um, and start rising dough. And then Monday, I'll just bake all day. And by baking all day, what I mean is I'm like, I already get up at 5 a.m. in the morning and write. And so I'll get up and prep my loaves at 5, pop them in. And by breakfast, we've got loaves. And then I start the next ones. But then I'm also working during the day. And then I come down for half an hour and do some baking and, and get bread going. And that's why I'm able to do 12 in a day. It's not like I'm over the oven for 12 hours. Um, but it's a 24-hour process just for the rise. Um, but I do love making um, a day of bread which I then had a whole chapter in my book, um, Deathless Beast, called Day of Bread. 
and if I ever opened a break bakery, it's probably what I would call it. Even if um, after book three it might have very different connotations. But you'll all have to find out when you read book three. I know there are a few people who are reading right now. I know Chago uh, is almost to the, to the end based on him noting something I didn't notice, and that was that I have a paladin named Averin, A-V-E-R-I-N, and that's why I keep misspelling the name of his series, which is the chat shades or the ashes of Averin, A-V-A-R-I-N. Um, happenstance, just like I have sentinels and, uh, <laughs> and griffins in mine too. So obviously we both draw from the same sets of inspiration um, because, um, or, or we're just author soulmates. Who knows, right? Sorry, Andrew. Wizard. It's Chago. Um, all right, so it's just me toying around with this and letting it do its thing. I've got this basically across the entire pan now. Almost there. Um, I wouldn't normally poke at my bread so much because it risks tearing holes in it. Um, but I really would like to get this on across the whole pan. So I've been goading some areas that are a little more poofy looking. Because it's such a wet dough, it is falling back into the holes. And as it rises in the oven, it's, it's going to mesh before it does anything. Um, so that's cool. But I am almost to my corners here. And I think we'll be able to pop it in here, here in a minute. So, I, yeah, I'm happy with this. I'm going to let it set for like three minutes. And then we'll do our cutting and scoring. And we're going to coat it with um, olive oil again. And we're going to coat it with olive oil when it comes out. But we're going to coat it with olive oil and put on some big salt crystals. Um, if you were making this as not a lembas bread, but I I'm going I'm to put Italian seasoning on it too. I love, love, love rosemary bread. So um, I'm going to add some rosemary too. So I'm going to grab that. Um, another thing I really love, which not everybody does, is I also love lavender. I don't have any right now, but I do love lavender. Uh, so lavender rosemary bread is, is oh, it's so good. All right. All right. So, you know, we're at 40 minutes now. I like how this is looking. I'm going to cut it down. I'm going to use a Yeah, I'm going to use this knife, which is my favorite knife. Um, uh, I just, I love it. One of the only things that I asked for when we got married was I said, I want a really nice knife set on our, and not a cheap knife set on our uh, wedding um, registry so that maybe somebody will get it, but I don't want to accidentally get a cheap knife set and my aunt was very nice and she obliged and she got us this incredibly nice knife set and it is done with us and will be with us for the rest of our days all right so what i'm going to do is i've got i'm going to cut down this middle and i'm going to cut twice and then from there i'm going to figure out where my squares are going to be um easy enough it's, it's just cutting and even it's actually pretty sticky so i'm going to get this wet actually basically cutting and separating this into into loaves um, they're going to grow back together and stick before they really set um, so it's okay that i'm doing this if i was just making focaccia that'd be, i'd be done i'd poke some holes in it and, and call it good but we're going to treat our scoring and our cutting as our pokes that we would do to capture olive oil um,
All right. I've got some squares. I'm just going to score and not try to cut through um, each of these into triangles. Just two triangles each, right? We're going to put olive oil all over it. It's a good sound. I talk too much to do like baking ASMR, so you're just going to listen to the cool sounds when they ha when they come and when they don't. Um, Tori says that lavender is good on a burn. It's good to know. All right, I put on that, right? So let's do some um, rosemary, because I love rosemary. It's one of the small reasons we moved to Colorado, because I'm really hoping I can get like a lavender bush going, or a, a rosemary bush going, because you just can't have a Washington. A little Italian seasoning, which is already in it. Let's put more on top, so it has a good roast on top. And then I got some thicker, coarse sea salt. Um, in the end, all salt is the same if you're baking into it. If you're baking it into something, putting it on top of something is where it starts to get different and the flavor profiles change. But all salt is the same, uh, you know, non-iodized, like the special salts, like, um, you know, black salt or, or pink uh, Hawaiian sea salt or flake salt. Um, special salts are fantastic. I love flake salt, like Cypress flake salt, but don't bake with it. Like, don't put it into your dough because then it just, just dissolves and it's just like buying coarse ground, right? Uh, but putting it on top of something, it's fantastic. Um, what this is missing is pepper. All right, cool. So I'm going to stick this in the oven now, and we're going to now turn our oven on to 375. My oven is a little colder, cooler than normal, so I'm going to go up about five degrees, 10 degrees to 85. And it's a little more pizza-y as well. Um, and it's going. So it's gonna it's gonna heat up once it hits uh, once it hits temperature. Um, then I'm gonna start timer for 20 minutes. Um, it could take as long as uh, 30 minutes to 40 minutes to bake. After 20 minutes, we're gonna start checking it every five minutes to see how it's looking. Um, Cause it's oven dependent, but there will be 20 minutes undisturbed while it's sitting in there, I'm not going to look in there because uh, an, a watch loaf never rises or bakes. So um, we're going to do that. So uh, in the meantime, how is everybody's bread coming? Or do you have any questions or, or concerns about bread slash what we're doing tomorrow night watching Lord of the Rings for six nights straight? Um, I'm so excited about this. Um, we watch it, you know, often, if not more than once a year, than with all the appendices and um, yeah, fills me with joy. It's a fallback for us. Um, yeah, what's everybody up to right now? How is your how is your bread coming? Stare at you and guilt you into saying something. Um, like I mentioned on Sunday, happy abstinence is hiatus this week because we're doing the watch along so it won't be this week so if you do follow me and watch map night on sunday nights we will not be doing that um ooh, what kind of pasta are you having k and what are you putting on top of it yeah i want to know because as much as I like bread, I also love pasta. I have a, a pasta maker that we got like last year. I still haven't used it. I need to actually pull it out. Trisha will attest to you. I am not a neat person. 
But one thing I have learned from um, my sister-in-law, uh, who is a baker, professional baker, uh, is to keep your station clean or soaked as often as possible because you do not want to come back to a bowl that you made dough in 12 hours later and have to clean it. So keep it underwater um, as soon as it's ready to go underwater so that you can, um, so that you can do that. So that's why I had the water running. Let's see. Um, so like I mentioned at the beginning, I, I'm an author too. If this is your first time watching me, uh, I have three books out currently, which are uh, Thrice, it's a Slavic fantasy, about a man and a boy on the road. The little boy has far too much magic than is good for anybody else. And so bad people want it because they want his magic. Um, and the father, Joven, just wants to give him a normal life. Um, its sequel, Four Scored, is coming out in one month on... Um, on the 4th of April. So it's going to be, and it's called Four Scored. So if it helps you remember, it's going to be Four Scored on 4-4 four four is its release date. Um, and then it's the third book, the culmination of that trilogy will be coming out in a year. I haven't written that yet. We'll get there. And then I have another series, which is the Collation Saga. Book one is the Deathless Beast, which um, is a multi-point of view, epic fantasy, modern epic fantasy, modern classic epic fantasy. And it follows paladins, um, one paladin who's being chosen by his god to become his champion while the order is collapsing around it. Uh, a pair of mercenaries, a brother and sister, who are just trying to make their way in life. Um, there's a physician who um, was kind of forced into the life of being the physician for um, an older an older couple, and she just wants choice in her life. Uh, but that older couple also happens to be basically the Pope and the Pope S of the two largest religions in the world so it's a prestigious position but she just wants choice um and so she's seeking that and stumbles upon a seed pod that is um centuries old and untouched by age and she uh has to care for it and and that becomes kind of what what defines her for for a while um and there is a figure who wears a chainmail cloak made of bone and that um is uh makes him invisible to the gods and he wants to kill the gods so that's just the plot of book one book two bone shroud right there uh takes place that winter you know, right after the first one ends and everybody is stuck kind of in the same city same city um as uh the events of book one um start to unfold and reveal themselves um to those who are there while the clouds the mercenary siblings are trying to set up a new um a new office and the paladins are just dealing with um not just miscommunication from the first book but now a group of paladins are trying to tear down the whole order from the inside and violently so um so those both all, all three of those books are already out four scored comes out on four four and then books three and four um for the collation saga will be coming out uh this summer and then uh this coming winter respectively uh, whether that's before Christmas or not has yet to be determined, but uh, they are coming out, and that'll finish the first arc of of the Collation Saga, which will be more than more than one arc. So that's what we've got coming out, um, and of course you'll get to hear me say that in very short every day for the next six days while we talk about who we are and introduce ourselves. But more importantly, we have some really cool guests that are going to be appear making appearances over the course of the next six uh, nights, including, um, let's see, we've got uh, Philip Chase, Andrew Wizard, uh, Nico uh, from Nico's Book Reviews, um, Murphy Napier, Tori, Tori from Tori Talks 2, and of course it's being hosted by my beautiful wife, Patricia Meredith. Uh, it's on her channel. And uh, you can go there right now, and her her call sign on YouTube is at P Meredith M E R E D I T H, author. That's her call sign. And you can go there right now and like, subscribe, and all six nights are already up. So you can hit click the notification bell for those, so that you can um, so that you're ready to see it. Right? Uh, it's gonna be pretty cool. Let's see. Did I forget? Did I forget anybody? It's everybody, right? I think it's everybody. If I think of some, Wizard. what? Wizard. Yeah, yeah. Andrew Wizard is going to be on there. Um, um, you know, we're going to be there every single night, and we're looking forward to seeing you there. I can't wait to watch Lord of the Rings again. Um, we keep getting to like halfway through Return of the King, and then something comes up, and so we start back over again because the best part is the Shire. Um, though personally, uh, Two Towers is my favorite, um, and that is because um, 
don't know. I just, I just, I really love the two towers and what they did. And when rewatching through the appendices recently, it's what's what's funny. What's what's great is that the first movie, uh, it had to be done. Alan, yes, Alan of Alexandria. Uh, Alexandria should do that too. Thank you, Troy. Um, so the the first movie had to be done perfectly to work, and they did. Uh, but everybody knows what it looks like. There, there's we all have this collective appearance of what it's supposed to be. Shire has to be done correctly. Elrond has to be done correctly. When it comes to book two, Two Towers is so good because of the fact that they got to in invent the Rohan, the, the Rohirrim, right? Um, they got to try to in analyze what was it that Tolkien wanted them to be as pure Saxon, you know, Anglo-Saxons with horses, um, which was how Tolkien described them. And and but they were the artists really got to kind of let loose and create all of this this amazing stuff. Um, and so that's that's why I like the Two Towers the most. It's a travesty that only book that only the third movie got uh, best movie of the year because it deserved it all three years. Um, in my opinion, they gave it to Return of the King because they owed it to them at that point that it didn't take all three didn't take all three years um, at the Academy Awards is um, a failure of society, in my opinion, um, because they're all just, they're all just, the, they, they are together the most perfect movie. Um, all right, preheat's almost there. Like I said, as soon as it hits preheat, we're gonna go 20 minutes uh, for our first checks. And I'm, I can already smell the rosemary starting to fry in the olive oil in there. It's so good. <laughs> I've said it before, I'll say it again, I love Rosemary. All right. Let's see what I'm missing. I agree, Tori. It's amazing that they even did um, that uh, they even did acknowledge it because it's a fantasy, um, but they could not. They had they had no choice. It was that good, right? Uh, Kay, in this case, I am using just um, some shaker rosemary we have because we moved, so I don't have a rosemary plant to pull off of. I would usually pull off of a rosemary plant. Um, um, so I mean, I'm sure you have the same problem growing rosemary up where you are, up in the Great White. Um, Washington State had the same problem. Even though we're at higher elevation in Colorado, there's so much sun. Um, that even in the winter, even deep freezes don't really, really happen here. So I should be able to, on our back porch, which will get some good western um, morning sun or eastern morning sun, um, grow some rosemary and get it really, really going. Uh, my grandmother was able to grow a lot of rosemary out in her front yard, but they were in a really weird valley that 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 snow never sat. Um, you know, you could have three feet of snow and they would only have six inches because it always came through and blew out right away. So it was very, very windy. But because of that, they had giant rosemary and sage out front i know like when you go into like phoenix arizona like their whole airport all the bushes outside are just straight rosemary just edible edible rosemary bushes that have been growing there for 50 years uh, that would be that would be amazing to be able to grow something like that um i try to grow what herbs we can um but you know an herb garden takes about three years to get going before you really have some good herbs oh, that's ready to go so i'm gonna start that yeah, but herb, an herb garden, if you get if you get really good going, you can build a good herb garden in about three years. And that's um, especially if you're doing it from your own starters and you're splitting your own um, herbs up. So like you take like you say, like you take time and you get time going, you can chop time plants in half and just separate them by an inch. They'll grow back together and you can take those and spread those out and basically in a large, you know, foot by foot area, you can start with just two time starters and from there split it and get a really good herb garden going um easy things to grow in your herb garden of course time anybody can grow time it's super easy um uh sage rosemary oregano is great but oregano uh, oregano will last and oregano runs too so it likes to put runners up and so you have to be careful if you don't want it to grow but if you don't want it to expand past a certain point do it in a pot um uh, lavender is super easy really fun one i've been trying to grow lately has been um hyssop uh like an like an anise hyssop um you get kind of a licorice flavor which i personally 
love licorice, so um, not everybody does, but I do. Um, and it's um, it's pretty easy to grow, um, and of course rosemary. But rosemary is is very particular about where it grows. Um, and, and I I agree, Andrew. Um, Helm's Deep in the books is like half of a page. In fact, they were spread it into half of a full movie, and it worked really well. I know some people get overwhelmed by it, but that's what the answer were for. And that's what Frodo and Sam were for, is splitting away and giving you a chance to um, not be too overwhelmed. Because you could, you could just watch just the Helm's Deep scenes, and then it's, what, um, 45 minutes, I think, if you do that. It's still a really long battle, but at least you can see everything, unlike that Game of Thrones episode where you couldn't see a thing. Uh, you can see things because um, Peter Jackson was a better movie maker. I like black licorice. I really like black licorice ice cream because it turns your tongue green. Um, but I don't like un I don't like salty licorice. Like when there's no sugar in it, it's, it doesn't do it for me. I'd rather cook with it than than eat it at that point. But that's where like uh, fennel or or um, tarragon, you can get that sweet um, sweet licorice flavor out of your garden without it being too licorice. -y. All right. So we're going to have 20 minutes here while we're waiting for the bread to just cook in there. Um, we're going to start checking it at that point to see how it's looking. I may even at that point um, boost, I, I, may, I may pop the oven up to even hotter, like um, to just finish it off at that point because it will be good and raised. It won't raise anymore, but if we want to get a good crisp, actually we don't. This is Lumbus bread. We're not going to do that. If I was making normal focaccia though, I would have whacked this up to like 450, 475, like a pizza to get a good brown on it. I want it to be white and lembassy. Um, and so so we're not going to do that. We're just going to keep an eye on it and make sure that it still has some spring to it, and but is it's got a good bake on it too. Um, yeah, like Andrew, I, I like licorice, but I also love licorice root which is what is more often in things like tobacco mixes because um, uh, licorice root has a very different flavor to it and also is really good for your throat. So like if I start getting a cold, I'm going straight to throat coat or buying, going and buying my own licorice uh, to make a licorice root um, uh, tea, uh, which does not taste like licorice. In my opinion, it doesn't taste like licorice at all. It's licorice root. It's a totally different thing. It has more of a mallow flavor to it probably, um, but, but it's also fantastic. So then my question, Tori, is do, have you had um, licorice root um, as opposed to licorice flavor for like throat coat tea, that kind of thing? Let's see. So just here, what can I talk about? What do you guys want to talk about while we're waiting for this? Is it Baker's Secrets? Yeah, I'll, yeah. Amateur baker secrets because I'm, I'm no professional. I'm I'm totally YouTube taught. I have one, um, uh, one YouTube sourdough video that I basically turned on while baking for the first ten times that I baked. Um, this I will send you the link. I found that it's this. I it's such a great, such a great sweater. Um, it's on it's on Amazon and it's got a lot of different colors, including like old school. Um, <laughs> like the brown and tan ones, nice and professorial. Um, but yeah, it, it, I got it for Christmas this year from my mom. And um, best thing I got <laughs> this Christmas was this sweater. It's so comfortable. Um, I might have to buy some more of them. And they're not that expensive either. I basically said, hey, what I'd love is like a Norwegian sweater. And she's like, I'm not buying you a $300 sweater, but I'll buy you this one. And she bought it and it's worth $300 to me. It's, it's such a good sweater. Um, it was, yeah, it's soft on the inside and the outside, and um, I pull it on all the time. So I will send you a video or a, a link for that. Um, I'll find that. I've got it, I've got it saved somewhere. Um, yeah, nothing like having a good sweater that you love. Uh, it does like to, yeah, I love it. My fave, I, so I spent, I, I've been brewing since 2016, 
when I moved out to the farm four years ago, I slowed down significantly. Um, and was only making one every six months or so and never in the winter because I just had to be outside when I make it. Um, and I was doing a lot of experimenting, but I really love making uh, German half of Isens, um, porters, but my favorite beer to make, I only make traditionally every other year. And that's where I make an old ale. So it's an ale that you make about eight to 10%. So a little bit stronger, but not a powerhouse. And then you age it for six months on wood and then you serve it. So it's a, it takes about a year to make because it is an aged beer. Um, and I designed it early on and I've kept the recipe this whole time to be, and I call, I call it old Toby because it's meant to taste like you're sitting in the Shire and smoking a, a pipe and sending smoke sails through rings. Um, and it's, it's a really, it's a really good ale. It's based on um, old stocks, old ale. Um, I looked up a, a clone. You can look at clones where it's, you know, I try to replicate a recipe. Um, so old stock, which also makes old Rasputin, right? Old stock um, has their, I found their recipe and then I added in um, British Fuggles and I also now add in um, Honeybush from Africa, which has a tobacco um, flavor to it. Um, like like, like um, not, not smoked tobacco, but regular tobacco. And then I just found at a local spice shop. A pepper called the Aleppo pepper. And there is another pepper that this uh, company makes. The, the company has, has sourced. This is the savory spice. They have another pepper. I forget what it's called, but I'll look it up. And it's a black pepper. Um, this Aleppo, this Aleppo pepper smells like, it smells like cherry tobacco. And the, um, the black pepper that that's uh, related to this one smells like it's a smoked pepper and it smells like smoked tobacco. Um, not like the really harsh, harsh smoked tobacco, but just a smoked tobacco. I'm going to put this in my next batch of old ale. Um, uh, probably what I'll end up doing is it'll be at the very, very end. I will put a lot of peppers into it for a day or two and then pull it out just to get that flavor in there it's really good but um so yeah that is my number one favorite beer to make is called my i, I call it old toby um though i have also um called it a couple of things too i'm always changing names of my beers because it's fun but um yeah i have not had old curmudgeon there's another one i don't think it's old curmudgeon there's another one that's from england that's considered really like the quintessential old ale but it's like Nothing like it because it's really weird. It might be old curmudgeon. And it's something I'd like to try. Um, because I, I, I like I like weird beers. Um, friend, My friend of mine, um, Thomas Crosscree, who is a, um, was my beer mentor. So I, he was, he opened a brewery, chatted with him, we made, became friends. And, um, and he is a historical beer and Groot uh, expert. So Groot, G-R-U-I-T, is a beer that doesn't, necessarily have hops in it but uses other herbs um for your for your bittering agents and so that's what he studied is what did the old welsh make what did the old english make before hops because hops have only been in significant use since the 15 1600s before that it was whatever herbs you could find throw some sage in there um for flavor and then hops just took over because of their preservative methods and because uh, some other political hijinks that were happening in Germany and it became what you use for all your beers. But it didn't always have to be that way. Um, so he was studying that. And so I learned a lot from him. Um, uh, almost became a brewer with, with him as an assistant brewer. It just didn't work, just didn't happen. But, um, and he's still doing his own thing and making uh, historical beers and meads and, um, and yeah, and do all that. Yeah, exactly. Andrew, hops are a preservative. Uh, they're they're a anti they're a bactericide, um, uh, fungicide. So they'll actually keep beers from going too bad. Um, yes, those purity laws, and it also had to do with Germany um, wanting to have control over what they could tax, and they couldn't tax herbs from your garden. So they basically said you can't use your, your herbs in your beer anymore. 
it's illegal because we want to tax you. And then there were a select group of people that had hops, which were also a weed, and they could control who grew the hops and then tax the hops and get get it off of that. So it really was kind of a the same thing happened in England a lot long time later with um, what you could use for your grains. And the Irish figured a way to get around it without having to import um, British grain uh, for their specialties. Um, yeah. A lot of hijinks, right? Especially in, in that kind of industry. We are at eight minutes left. So we'll check and see how our bread is doing. Um, circling back to the very beginning again, I am making Lembus bread, if you're just now tuning in. And we're making Lembus bread because tomorrow we're going to be starting a Lord of the Rings watch along over on my wife's channel, which is at P Meredith Author. P M E R E D I T H author, like it's spelled. Um, and that's going to be the next six nights, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're going to watch half of a uh, Lord of the Rings movie every night until we finish the whole thing. And we're going to be on live stream with friends like Andrew Wizard, who's in the chat right now, Alan of Alan, Alan of the Library of Alan, Alexandria, uh, Nico from Nico's Book Reviews, uh, Tori from Tori Talks 2 on YouTube, who just, congratulations, hit a, a very big milestone of uh, 2,000 subscribers. Congratulations. Um, I know that uh, Philip Chase is going to make an appearance, uh, Murphy Napier, uh, myself, Patricia, we're all going to be on there uh, just having a grand old time um, watching Lord of the Rings. For those of you who do watch from home, um, you're going to be watching it on your own. We're not going to putting we're not going to be putting it up on the screen because that would be against copyright laws. But we will be commenting and keeping a running banner on what scene we're on, so that you can uh, catch up with us and um, and know where we're at. Um, that starts tomorrow night. And if you're watching this months from now, it's not tomorrow night. It's whenever you want because you can watch them on. Uh, Patricia's channel right now and um, watch it in, in the post. And the those of you who are not on the stream, please come and be in the live chat. It's going to be chaos. It always is. And having your own conversations and we'll see who's the first person to um, make a comment on Viggo Mortensen breaking his toe and uh, and all that fun stuff. So, so yeah, that's what's happening. And right now, my Lembus bread, which I'm making for the event, is in the oven. We have eight more minutes before we start taking a peek at it, and uh, we'll see how see how it turned out. Like, it smells amazing in here, um, really good. Um, yeah, for those who weren't here earlier, these are my decorations of uh, different Lord of the Rings books I have, including uh, my copy of Return of the King, signed by Aragorn himself. Uh, when he came into my, into my bookstore, the um, the gold box special edition from Ballantine. I, don't, I think, let's see what year this is. And I was able to save the gold box right as the, um, right as it came into our used bookstore. It almost threw away. Travesty. This is a 1973 is when this was, is when this was made. Nope, 77. 61st printing. 77, and it was, um, let's see, Lord of the Rings came out in 44, so that's going to be a number. 33 years. So, actually, this would have been as old as, um, this was printed at the same year that Frodo would have turned coming of age, because he turns 33 in um, the beginning of Fellowship of the Ring. So, yeah. I'm going to get some water. This is uh, drinking my water from my Green Dragon mug that my sister-in-law brought back. She worked at Hobbiton for a year. As a tour guide. And my wife says she wants me to do a reading. So what should I read from? Lord of the Rings? Does that work? And are you wanting me to, oh, don't start me on the merry fellow, Andrew Wizard. I'll make people mad. He wants to know my thoughts on Tom Bombadil. Okay, you know what? There's nobody here. Who cares, right? Here are my thoughts on Tom Bombadil. I just recently, so I read Lord of the Rings in college. Uh, I took a class in college, 
having watched all the movies, the third one might not have been out yet, but I took this class and read through them all. Um, haven't read it since then. And then we just recently picked up the Andy Circus version of Lord of the Rings, which is so good. Um, it's available. Buy it now. Buy, buy it. Don't don't get it on Audible. Pay, pay them. Let's get the cash over to them. Because they did an amazing job. Andy Circus has read all four of these. He does it in voice, emulating, but not exact, each of the actors from the movies, but in his own spin, except for Gollum, which he totally does as Gollum. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. All right, so I'm listening through against Tom Bombadil, and nothing against those who love Tom Bombadil. I get it, and I'm going to make a assumption that those who love Tom Bombadil are those who read Lord of the Rings when they were impressionable not adults for their first reading of Lord of the Rings. Um, because I don't get it. I don't get him. Um, because he, he doesn't make sense. So from, from, from a writer's point of view, I understand what Tolkien was doing. I think everything up to the council of Elrond is actually a bracketed version of what's going to happen over the course of the entire series that the, the, the Barrow Whites represent the, um, the Ringwraiths. The Tom Bombadil himself is the is 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 the Eagles. Is um, is the the new catastrophe that happens that you know Frodo failed. He gets to the end and he fails. Right. He, but it was still meant. The ring was still meant to go into the mount into the mount into Mount Doom by my means of Gollum. Right. Um, I can't take Tom Bombadil seriously. I know that there are thoughts and theories that he is maybe a representative of. Um, not even above a lar of of the of the creator himself in the world, and or that he is the uh, representation of the world of Middle Earth as of the spirit of Middle Earth. Because when he talks, he's very distracted. Um, he'll all of a sudden disappear to something he's thinking because he realizes something else is, is happening across the world of Arda, right, Middle Earth. Um, so that may be very true, but uh, he's a little too he's a little too goofy for me. Um, he's a little too um, unserious for me um, because the whole rest of the book is serious. And that's where it doesn't get me is that, um, anyway, I could go on for a very long time, but I don't want to make anybody too mad. Um, thank you, Kate, for coming. Yep. Have a wonderful night. And uh, and I can't wait to see what you bake. Take some, some pictures. Please do. i uh, love to see what you bake and have, have a great night. Um, all right. So, Andrew, that's my opinion. My opinion is that is that Tom Bombadil was not necessary. I'm, I'm kind of. I, I know there's been rumors that he might show up in a new season of Rings of Power, and I hope he does. But I also am going to make an assumption that they're actually going to get him correct, and it's going to make people mad. But if only because they're going to realize it's exactly how he's written. Um, so I look forward to seeing how they do him and if they do him well. Um, but I don't know how well he's going to be um, taken um, if he does show up. Anyway, that's my opinion. Um, we're hitting our 20 minutes. I'm going to check the um, the bread. We're going to see how it looks. And then I will, um, I'll do a reading. So if anybody has any something they'd like me to read, I can read it straight. Or if you want, I can do what I did on Instagram and read it uh, in a country western voice. You choose. Pick something for me to read, whether it's from Lord of the Rings, from my own books, and I will read it right now after I check my bread. Oh, I don't need to. It's done. Yeah, a little overdone. So there we go. It's pretty brown around the edges, probably because I didn't let it rise. And if I let it rise for 90 minutes or longer. I've got some great pieces over here. So I have some salvageable bits. I might even cut these into nice triangles. I might even make another batch after this live stream too. Um, I guess I will read from the Hobbit before we go, um, but it's done. I'm gonna pull it out and um, get it onto a cooling rack and then and then I'll read just things. So just one moment here. And that'll give it a chance to cool down before I, and while I'm reading, and then we'll taste it and see um, how utterly jealous we can make uh, Andrew Wizardly. Let's
All right, so we're waiting for that to cool. Let's see. Smaug discovering Bilbo. Chapter All right, here we go. All right, with voices. Smaug certainly looked fast asleep, almost dead and dark, with scarcely a snore more than a whiff of unseen steam, when Bilbo peeped once more from the entrance. He was just about to step out on the floor when he caught a sudden, thin and piercing ray of red from under the drooping lid of Smaug's left eye. He was only pretending to sleep. He was watching the tunnel entrance. Hurriedly, Bilbo stepped back and blessed the luck of his ring. Then Smaug spoke. Well, thief, I smell you and I feel your air. I hear your breath. Come along, help yourself again. There is plenty and to spare. But Bilbo was not quite so unlearned in Dragonlore as all that, and if Smaug hoped to get him to come nearer so easily, he was disappointed. No, thank you, oh, Smaug the Tremendous, he replied. I do not come for presents. I only wish to have a look at you and see if you were truly as great as the tales say. I did not believe them. Do you now, said the dragon, somewhat flattered, even though he did not believe a word of it. Truly, songs and tales fall utterly short of the reality, O oh, Smaug, the chiefest and greatest of calamities, replied Bilbo. You have nice manners for a thief and a liar, said the dragon. You seem familiar with my name, and I don't seem to remember smelling you before. Who are you, and where do you come from, may I ask? You may indeed. I come from under the hill, and under the hills, and over the hills, and my paths led, and through the air. I am he who walks unseen. So I can well believe, said Smaug, but that is hardly your usual name. I am the clue finder, the web cutter, the stinging fly. I was chosen for the lucky number. Lovely titles, sneered the dragon, but lucky numbers don't always come off. I am he that buries his friends alive and drowns them and draws them alive again from the water. I came from the end of a bag, but no bag went over me. These don't sound so creditable, scoffed Smaug. I am the I am the friend of bears and guest of eagles. I am ring winner and luck wearer. I am barrel rider, went on Bilbo, beginning to be pleased with his riddling. That's better, said Smaug, but don't let your imagination run away with you. This is, of course, the way to talk to dragons. If you don't want to reveal your proper name, which is wise, and don't want to infuriate them by a flat refusal, which is also very wise. No dragon can resist the fascination of riddling talk and of wasting time trying to understand it. There was a lot here that Smaug did not understand at all, though I expect you do, since you know all of Bilbo's adventures to which he was referring. But he thought he understood enough, and he chuckled in his wicked inside. I thought I thought so last night, he smiled to himself. Lake men, some nasty schemes of those miserable tub-trading lake men, or I'm a lizard, and I haven't been down that way for an age and an age, but I shall soon alter that. There we are. And to celebrate, let us take some Limbus bread. Which breaks very nicely. Oh, crackle. 
There we go. Lemon spread. I'm going to make a second batch now after we go. It's really good. Take your time. If you have time, make sure you're doing all of that uh, raising. And the more raising, the better. Go for doubles. You know, you mix it together, let it rise double. Put it out on the pan, let it rise double. And go from there. All of you, have a wonderful day. And tomorrow night, I will see you on our Lord of the Rings watch along here. I'm going to step off screen and start the uh, video as they're going out. But love you guys, and I'll uh, bake with you later. Bye.